There's been a slew of challenges that have come your way to keep that success and momentum going. What are they? I, I think that Montclair um, really is, is, the, is the poster child, if you will, for the way that demographics and psychographics are moving in our country. Uh, we're a community that has six train stations, a community that has uh, vibrant downtown spaces, walkable downtown spaces, and we were essentially uh, an environment which went to come and find all the things that, uh, that generally people across all age spectrums today are looking for. Walkability, livability, the, uh, the, the robust nature of our restaurants now. So there's a little bit of a chicken and egg kind of thing going on, but I really believe that our community um, represents where our state and our country is going in terms of the way that uh, people want to live. And I think too that um, our history of uh, tradition of diversity and inclusiveness uh, also appeals to where most people are now uh, uh, psychologically. Uh, so I think we are again just sort of this um, perfect uh, setting, if you will, and I don't mean we're a perfect community because we're not, but we certainly offer many of the, uh, uh, many of the attributes and many of the things that people are looking for today in the living room. There are those challenges that come with having such a, a boom and, and having so much attention development for it pretty, you know, pretty rapidly, I, I would say. What have been the challenges for you and for your council in keeping up and making sure that um, that progress continues? Well, um, I, I think what we've done uh, as a council is just create an environment. I think our job is to create an environment in which people can thrive. Um, we are setting the table, if you will, to let uh, individuals and individual businesses come in and, and, and provide the kind of uh, development if that's the case, start a new business, um, refurbish a home, refurbish a, an apartment, whatever it might be. But we create a bar environment in which that, um, that one feels comfortable doing that. And again, um, and, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about this a little bit later, but some of the strides I think that we've made uh, financially in our community, and I know we're going to talk about it, infrastructure as well too. Um, when people look at our community now, yeah, they look at one that is financially um, head and shoulders above most in our community. We're at the top, in New Jersey, one of the top three percent of financially, um, how we're financially situated. That wasn't the case six years ago, by far. Um, so they see us on this traje trajectory of uh, growth and, and I think prosperity. Um, we're working hard to make sure that we don't lose uh, some of the very fundamental elements. I know Mr. Scott will talk about this later, but you know, in terms of affordable housing, we'll make sure that people are able to stay. And I think some of the new developments are allowing us to build affordable units. So <clears throat> all those things are out there, but I, I believe that we're going to tap into that in, in, a, in a fairly good, in a good way. Councilwoman, why are businesses, why do folks want to develop here? I think that one of the main reasons that people want to develop in the township of Montclair is because they recognize, as we do, um, that we are on the cutting edge and that we're moving in a direction that is welcoming of people from, from all areas. And proactively, we've made decisions that would make this an attractive area. For example, um, with the document, the master plan, um, our township decided to pretty much taken an unprecedented move in combining the land use and the circulation in the township of Montclair to make sure that any development that we do moving forward will consider circulation, it will consider the mobility of the residents here, it will consider um, transportation and a transit system and parking. And so when businesses look around, they're very interested in how will people get to my store. So we pay close attention um, to the transit situation we uh, created within the last few years, transit villages around all of our major train stations, and they want to know about parking. And we've been very, very careful um, to provide situations that we, we think will not impede the businesses during the time that we're developing. In fact, um, looking at the Seymour Street development going on there, the developer has a complete project just to address the parking to make sure that we are um, courteous of our businesses and the residents. And so I think that people look at that and they say, hey, this is a great place. We're located in a central location right outside of New York and they want to be a part of the energy that we feel here in Montclair. Well, 
let's talk about that. What are some of the policies either you're working on or that have been implemented to minimize the impact of development on this area? Because we're talking about quality of life issues and certainly that's what arises most when you have um, things like this coming along. So what are you working on as a council right now to address that? So um, the, the, the most recent um, policy that, that we're discussing is an energy aggregation um, policy program that we uh, just discussed at Tuesday's meeting and what that would do would um, allow us to partner with um, Maplewood and um, West Orange, Verona, South Orange, and no, there's one other one, Flint Ridge, and do an aggregated energy um, program here. And by doing that, we're hoping that uh, the cost for energy then will go down for the residents and that we can provide um, a, a cleaner energy for them. And we've spent a lot of time uh, within the last few years um, making sure that we're looking at sustainability um, efforts. Our, our township has been designated um, a sustainable township, think, I believe, since two, 20, um, 2009. And um, so we're on cutting edge in terms of that. We're also one of the first townships that is um, electric um, charging stations for cars. So we're doing a lot in terms of sustainability. We're also doing a lot in terms of maintaining op open spaces as we move forward. Um, for the first time in many years, we're actually creating um, a new open space park um, in the south end of town. But we're, we're conscientious, and so we're not working in, in an iso isolated situation. When we're making the policies, the great thing about Montclair is that, that it's always a collaboration. So we use the master plan um, pretty much as the blueprint for um, how we're going to develop for commercial districts, for residential districts, for open space, for housing, for all of those things. And after we've looked at the blueprint, and, and it's so important that we're all familiar with that, then we can um, look at areas that we need to improve upon, as we did. And we can also look at areas that perhaps we need to create new ordinances and new laws so that we can um, further substantiate the things that we said that we wanted in our master plan. Mr. Mayor, let's bring you in on that. Let's talk about um, right now that the township has a AAA bond rating. Yes, you've been working to reduce debt. So I imagine that that's helping considerably. Um, but you're also up against some issues with the new tax reform and, and bringing down property values. So is that throwing a, a curveball at you in terms of moving forward with some of these, these projects and things that have been in the works now for quite some time? Uh, I would say absolutely not. Uh, we've not seen any diminution whatsoever in property values. Uh, in fact, if you look at uh, some of the more recent studies that uh, Zillow and some of the other groups have done, we're in the top uh, 15 of, of towns uh, statewide in terms of property uh, value growth, um, which is particularly um, amazing, in my opinion, for, for Montclair because our average value of our properties is so high. So when you have uh, uh, va average value properties growing at 10% a year, which we are, puts us in the top, um, I believe we're in the top 10. Uh, so we have this tremendous, uh, and it's driven by the fact that people want to be here. Um, it's, it it kind of harkens back to some of the early days in the 2000s when we had the multiple bidding, and that's going on now. It's not as quite as crazy as that, but it's getting close. So um, people from around the, the New York metropolitan region, in fact, around the country, um, see so much of what's going on in town um, and what we, uh, of our history, and they, and they really want to be here. So I have not seen um, uh, that in terms of, of the, the lowering of our values. It does put, there's no question, that uh, the lack of deductibility uh, impacts people who live here, and that's, of course, our, our concern. Um, but it hasn't, um, has not as, as at all diminished the fervor of people who want to be here. Um, I'm, we'll, we'll, we'll wait and see. I know I believe that the IRS announced uh, yesterday that it's going to be coming out with this ruling fairly quickly about how it's going to treat uh, allowing us to do some things to help to mitigate that, uh, the impact. But um, I can honestly say that I have, and I think the, the real estate community would agree, that uh, we have just not seen it impacted. And we'll note the Attorney General for New Jersey has, is planning to, to give some pushback on that. That is correct. Did you want to jump in, Dr. Baskerville, before we move on on that topic? Um, I, I, just, I wanted to just um, share a little bit more in terms of the policies, because as we look at the township of Montclair and 
we realize that the household size is decreasing and that um, we are having an increase in, in um, an older population, which we think is a wonderful thing. Uh, we, we did see that we needed to shift and, and address some of our policies just to make sure that we are providing um, situations that are affordable. I'm sure um, Ann LaPelle and Mr. Scott will, will talk more about that. But um, so in terms of just the policies, we, we have you know, made some adjustments to them. Um, recently, we uh, have taken a, a long look at the transit system here. Um, and recently, we just changed. Uh, in fact, we're looking to improve um, the way we're providing train services there. We've expanded on our senior services thanks to our outstanding Senior Citizen Advisory Commission. We now have Easy Ride to help um, seniors to, to get, you know, to local, local areas. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited that I think we're keeping pace with that which we see. And we've done studies out to 2035 to really demonstrate um, the tide, the wave, the direction that we believe Montclair is going in. Peter, has this development and this growth shifted the demographic here? Is this changing the face of the township as we've known it? Well, I think there's been a lot of change in a couple of distinct directions in Montclair over the past few years. Uh, m most places have what you call a, a bell curve of income distribution with very few very rich people, very few very poor people, and kind of a big hump in the middle. Mm -hmm. Montclair, interestingly, is much more saddle-shaped. We, we have a large population of very well-off folks and a large population of folks who are still struggling. Now, this is amidst all the successes that we've talked about, the growth, a proactive um, town council focused on interesting policymaking. I mean, this is a very, very civic town, and people are interested in the art of government can get involved and have good ideas and push them forward. But there are some big structural factors that we have to uh, really pay attention to to prevent the middle class from getting even more hollowed out. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have moved out of Montclair who were middle class. Um, a lot of it had to do with the real estate boom when people whose houses were paid off um, could find lower taxes and better quality of life, uh, mostly down south, and, and a lot of them left, and neighborhoods changed composition. And there are a lot of middle class black neighborhoods that are now mixed or white as folks have moved in, and there are still a lot of folks struggling in pockets of Montclair. I, I just went to the, uh, the pre-prom for the junior prom last night. And, um, and because I'm just crazy about this data, I, I realized, you know, I had, I, we had gone from the edge of Glenfield Park to this beautiful mansion with gables and windows and a bocce court. And I, and I actually took a look at the census tract data. And in, within a mile and a half of each other, the two places that I went from and to, um, about 80% of households in the first area were lower moderate income, according to the census and 0% were in the second neighborhood, the destination we were in. They're within a 10 minute walk of each other. And um, at United Way, we focus now for 10 years on something we called ALICE, which is asset limited, income constrained, employed. So that's working families. And the numbers are staggering. Across the country, 40% of ALICE households are struggling to meet basic expenses. We're just talking about food, housing, the telephone. What's the threshold, the income threshold? Well, to be it varies, it varies, it varies by state and by county. We now have county level data and it, in Essex County just to provide that. It also varies by household size. But the, the key thing is it's considerably higher than the poverty level. I mean, we all talk about and think about the poverty level because that's the data we have. The truth is, is that at a threshold two or three times the poverty level, folks are still struggling to make basic ends meet. And that means a couple of things here in Montclair. It means, one, the numbers are large, right? And Alice population folks are the people who repair our cars, who provide our childcare, often who are our teachers, who are starting businesses, um, who do our landscaping. It's a big chunk of the population. But it's also because we have that saddle shape, right? It's very easy sometimes for folks at opposite ends of that wealth distribution to, to meet each other. It's, sometimes it's hard for each end of Bloomfield Avenue to meet the other physically, right? It's hard for us to see each other. But when you look at the fact that so many working families are struggling, there's actually a, a much greater commonality than we might think between folks who are defined as poor and folks who just have jobs that either are seasonal or they switch jobs or they can't pay for childcare or healthcare, any of these needs. The thing we all, they, all, they all have in common 
is they're basically one bad event away from financial disaster, a job loss, a divorce, a bad storm, and a tree hits your house. You lose your job, you, can't, you get sick. It's very hard for a lot of folks to plan ahead, to have any kind of security. So amidst this success story, I mean, there's no question. I mean, the, the town's bond rating has gone up while enacting creative policies about housing and open space and conservation and sustainability. It's kind of an all fronts forward success story. But because of big structural factors that affect the whole country, but also in particular because of demographic changes in Montclair, we have, to, we have to pay special attention to the fact that there's still a lot of these folks struggling while they're working. One of the things, actually, Councilman Baskerville and I spoke about this uh, previously, is when we look at all of the development happening downtown, I mean, the downtown was awarded a national award in 2015 yeah. for that, but yet you still have this portion of the community who can't afford to go visit those restaurants, who can't afford That's to go cool. shop at those boutiques and those stores. Um, and as a matter of fact, since you brought up the census numbers, it was 15% of African-American families in particular who have relocated from Montclair since the last census. So what are we doing as a township then to look at that population in need to make sure that there are priorities in place so that they aren't having to pick up and relocate, many of them with families, with children in the school system? I would be happy to to answer that. I didn't know if you wanted Mr. Scott to go first because if I begin to answer it, I may step on his toes. But I'll be happy to, to sure, answer we'll, that. We'll defer to Scott and we can come back to you. Uh, oh, okay. Or I'll if you're happy, ready. I'll be happy to go for it. <laughs> can I answer that? You sure can. We're not doing anything. I mean, the bottom line is without rent control, the poor population in this town, the underserved population is hitting the road. I mean, that is the bottom line. When you look at the schools, when you look at the number of kids and families that are in the free and reduced lunch, which we get school aid for, it's dropping every year. So the bottom line is, to keep it real, is that we're doing nothing to prevent that from happening. Without rent control in this community, I'm quite sure Mr. Scott's going to talk about this, this town, the character of this town is changing and will continue to change. And when you listen to the great success stories as to why people want to come to Montclair, every story has two sides. So while people want to come to Montclair, you know, great school system, everything, the bottom line is we're losing our character and we're losing a lot of African-American families who are forced to leave town. Mayor Jackson, how, how is the township, and Councilman will come to you after. I, I, I would have to um, take exception to, to, to some of what Mr. Um, Pelham said. Uh, one, uh, with respect to affordable housing, one of the things that we've done uh, is to, because we have, in the past, because we have done a good job of, a, of a building the amount of affordable housing that we're required to do as part of the COA process, we're no longer subject to the rules and regulations of COA. What does that mean? That means that now, going forward, all the affordable housing that, that's going to be built can be designed for Montclair, current Montclair residents or people who have lived here before who want to come back. Here to four, we would build 10 affordable units and maybe four of them would go to Montclair residents. Going forward, 100% of our affordable housing units will be dedicated um, to, to, to Montclair residents. The other thing that we've done in terms of the, the, one of the things why the, the, the financial impact is, is important too is because um, we talk about the amount of taxes that we, that we pay here, and the taxes in Essex County and northern New Jersey are high, um, but the growth in property taxes here over the last, since this council certainly has been, it's averaged almost 1% almost of the municipal rate. So we've tried to keep the, the tax burden um, uh, down. The, the other thing that I, that I would say is that I think that, um, uh, uh, you know, when we look at what's happening in Montclair, some people, of course, are um, looking to uh, move out of the state, but people, you know, many people are taking a windfall in terms of the value of their homes that they're going and moving to South Carolina or moving whatever. So there's some of that going on. But we're also trying to look at the, look at the idea that, um, you know, uh, uh, things change. And, we, and I'm going to talk about, if I may, just talk about rent control a little bit. Um, rent control, I think that 
that, that people throw that out and say, oh, it's, it's a panacea. Um, but I, my, my challenge is, and my question is to, to people who talk about rent control, when you look at the communities around us that have rent control, Bloomfield, some of the Caldwells, um, I think maybe Roseanne and some of the other communities, none of them, over the years that they've had it, where has rent control led to them <coughs> having the kind of diversity that we have? Our, our African American population has been, for the last hundred years, about 25 percent. I think it got up to 28 or 29 percent in a couple of a couple of a couple of times. But it's been 25 percent African American population for a hundred years. Tell me where in any of the communities that we're talking about that have implemented where rent control has led to any other kind of socioeconomic or racial diversity that we say that we that we are so interested in. Show me where that has led to that result. I mean, it's nice to say you have it, but it's, there's no evidence, there's no data to suggest that the imposition of rent control has made any of the communities around us any more, in fact, they're, they're substantially homogenous. They're not, if you go around to some of the communities that we list that have it, show me where the, where the minorities are. There are none. So I'm, 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 my question is, what are we doing in Montclair that has kept our population in the 25 to 35 to 30 percent minority for 100 years uh, without rent control, and other communities that have rent control, their, their population of minorities has not grown. In fact, it's gone down. And it's nothing. It's 2 and 3 percent, and ours is 25 to 30 percent. I, I, I'm, I'm more interested in the results than I am in, a, in, a, in what might be seen, by some might call a panacea. Councilman, we'll come to you, then Ann and William will come to you right after that. Go ahead. Okay. Um, and so um, I'd just like to um, follow up on what Mr. Pelham said when he said that we're doing nothing. And, and I really, um, I find that offensive because Montclair has done such an outstanding job for the last many years of making sure that we're providing affordable housing um, for many years at a 20% rate when there was new development that at this point in time we have some flexibility on how we can actually uh, deliver that and, and recently in terms of policy change what we've been able to do now is to say that no longer do we want to be under COA where we were uh, bound by a regional um, group of people that can vie for our affordable housing because we've done such an outstanding job at providing affordable housing in years past, we're now in a situation where we can actually say that we want to provide the affordable housing at the 20% rate that we decided we wanted for all new development over five units, and we want to have that specifically for our Montclair residents because it does matter to us because we don't want them to have to leave. So an example will be um, if things move forward, and this is not um, a done deal yet, but just um, as we're talking about the Lackawanna Plaza, one of the things that really was motivating me just to say, okay, you know, we've, we've got a plan that I think, you know, we should just go ahead and try, try to work with is because in that plan alone, if things move forward with that, we will have 31 affordable units. And under our new policies, those 31 units will go to our Montclair Township residents. And so I think we, we're falling short from where I would like to be, certainly. But to just say we're doing nothing, I find that offensive. And I think we're doing a whole lot more. We could do much more. We could do better. We could do better by providing affordable uh, housing throughout the township at larger numbers. We have land right now where we can go into Ward 1 and put affordable housing. We haven't done that yet. But we are, you know, moving forward with our eyes open and we are trying to do the things that um, will allow us to move forward um, economically and to, to preserve the people. And so, yes, I think we could be doing more. Mr. Pelham, please don't get me wrong. You know I understand that. And yes, I am very concerned that in 2018, we still do have pockets of color line pockets where you have, where you can walk down the street and you have all people of lower socioeconomics. That should not be. Under provision of the Fair Housing Act, we should have been through that. In a township like Montclair, we should not, we should not have that. But for, to say that we're just doing nothing is far from truth. And I think we are doing some very good things and, and we've got a lot more work to do. Uh, William and Albert will come to you. But Anne, you focus on seniors. So the question to you is, is new development addressing the housing needs for seniors who are also in this category very often of, of having a fixed income, a low income? Actually, there, is a, there are some issues here. 
Um, I think age diversity is just as important to talk about as uh, racial diversity and income diversity. <clears throat> in Montclair, we actually have <clears throat> two different types of um, senior housing. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> we have many homeowners who are retired living in homes that they'd love to age in place in, but they cannot afford to keep up because of taxes, because of the cost of repair. These folks would like to downsize, but they'd like to downsize into housing that they can predict the budgetary implications for. So if you can only get a year lease and you can't predict outward what your rent is going to be two, three years in advance, it doesn't work for seniors. <clears throat> they have to have some security. And if we can incentivize landlords to be able to offer multi-year leases to seniors, that would be a big help. The other thing is that we have a lot of people in rental units right now who have no security. And we'd like to find a way to give them some sort of security. Mm -hmm. The state has done a, an analysis of the Elder Economic Insecurity Index. And 54% of New Jersey elders will not be able to afford basic needs, including housing. Aging in place only works if we have a network of services to support these people. And it's not just housing. It's transportation. It's food security. It's inclusion. And it's also civic participation. Now, the township has engaged in the age-friendly certification process. Here's an area where the township has actually moved ahead from uh, a public policy standpoint. AR ARP has this certification, and we applied for it in 2015, 2016. And the certification is aspirational. You've got to set up an action plan based upon eight domains of livability. And you've heard from some of my colleagues that we've actually made lots of progress in some of these domains. In transportation, not only do we have some of the best mass transportation here and walkable communities, walkable to business areas, but we now have a senior bus that picks people up at their homes and takes them to their destinations. We have a taxi voucher program where seniors can take taxis for 50% of the cost. That's a grant-funded program. We have done quite a bit in terms of inclusion and social participation. We have a wonderful program called The Mill, which is the Montclair Institute for Lifelong Learning, a grant-funded program where seniors can take adult ed ranging from the most sophisticated political discussions to the most creative at the art museum to healthy classes, classes in health, at no cost. These are wonderful things for seniors. But we run into problems in some of the areas where we've all experienced issues. And the main one is housing. The surveys that we've done since 2013 indicate the respondents say, by and large, 90% want to stay here to age in place. And there are health reasons why they should. But 75% of them say they cannot afford to. I have that report. It's here. here. And housing is the number one issue, followed by transportation, whether that be public or what have you. Um, I just want to bring in William Scott again with the NAACP, the housing chapter there. One, we bring this back here. We started talking about Alice. 23% of the Montclair households in Montclair are considered Alice. So from your vantage point, are we doing enough to wrap around to ensure that these policies are in place? Well, going back about 10, 15 years ago, there was a significant study done in the township of Montclair to address the, the housing concerns going back that far. And there absolutely was a, a shortfall on affordable housing identified then. Uh, we tried to put a goal in place of creating at that particular time, I think it was 2,000 affordable units, and then we wanted to make that number a little bit more realistic. It came down to about 1,400 units. And if you just look at the inventory of affordable housing that we have currently in the township, we're around 650, 700 units. So 
So obviously we have not uh, accomplished what we set out to do 15 years ago. Uh, and affordable housing, uh, there's, there's two parts to it. You know, the township will never build enough affordable housing. I mean, we've got a lot of development underway, but when you're talking in terms of 20 units, 30 units, 40 units, whatever the case might be, in these larger projects, it's not going to satisfy the, the real need of affordable housing. You know, we have a, a current waiting list of affordable housing uh, in the township of Montclair. It's, it's in the 2,500, 3,000 uh, range of uh, applicants. So, you know, uh, when we start the conversation about rent control, rent control or rent stabilization, you really want to be able to stabilize the increases in rents in the township. Uh, because without that stabilization, the market rates for uh, rental units are very, very high in this township. And, and just to address uh, one of the responses from the mayor, uh, you know, where are the residents going when they move out into Montclair? Well, they are going to Bloomfield, Verona, Caldwell, Maplewood, East Orange. East Orange. They're moving into other communities to stabilize their situation as it, as it relates to uh, rents. So, you know, I think there's a twofold uh, need here, not only for just affordable housing, which is going to be uh, accomplished a little bit better with some of the newer projects, and some of the newer policies that we're going to be putting in place in our affordable housing uh, ordinance, but we also have to take a look at the uh, conversation in regards to rent control. Uh, you know, I've been working with uh, an organization in the township uh, from a media standpoint, which is Planet Civics, and we started a, a rent control initiative or conversation just to determine if there's something we really want to take a look at. And, and the reason we wanted to take a look at it, because really uh, about 42, 43 percent of the residents of Montclair are renters. Uh, that's a huge number when you're talking a population of close to 38, 39,000 residents of the township of Montclair. So, you know, I've, uh, we've gotten some positive feedback uh, from our survey, which is online. Uh, we've, we're going to leave the uh, survey open for a few more months. We're seeking to put together a, a working group uh, so we can, you know, take this conversation a little bit further as it relates to uh, rent control. But, uh, you know, I, I think the stabilization of the uh, market rate uh, units uh, is going to have to be something we take a very serious look at. You know, when you're talking about uh, a one-bedroom apartment, seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars $1,800, two-bedroom apartment, $2,300, $2,400, three-bedroom apartments, if you can find one, you're looking in the range of $3,000. In addition to you have to pay all your utilities, these are, these are significant uh, challenges for people that have to pay those kind of income, whether it's a two-family, uh, uh, two-income family or one-income family. There is a major issue in the township when it comes to affordability uh, from a renter's standpoint. Correct me if I'm wrong, though, Albert. This idea of a rent cap, a rent increase stabilization was put to a referendum in the past and was right. voted down which speaks to the character of this town. Look, my organization, Peter can talk about Alice, uh, people that are the working poor. Well, my organization deals with people that are way, way below Alice. And every day, people are leaving this town. They're coming to my office looking for security, deposits or something, they cannot afford to stay in this town. The character and the culture of this town is changing. And rent stabilization, you know, William Scott has said it. We, we want to put it back out there. We want to see what the conscience of this town is. And if it doesn't get enough votes, then it's, that speaks volumes. But right now, as far as I'm concerned, the people that come to my office every day, they're leaving because they cannot afford to stay in this town. Peter, I want to bring you into this conversation, but I do also want to know affordable housing is an issue that towns across the state are facing, not just Montclair. This is a statewide issue, um, especially for the fact that, you know, uh, the panelists are referencing 
ACOA, the Council on Affordable Housing, which was defunct for several years and didn't uh, really facilitate how many affordable housing units needed to be given. And now everyone is playing catch up. So this is not a problem unique to Montclair. This is a problem we're seeing everywhere. So we're not, you know, just pinpointing this here. Mr. Mayor, we'll come to you. I just want to bring Peter in very quickly. Go ahead, Peter. The reason why that's the case is because there's this multiple whammy going on where the majority of jobs that are being created are pay less than $20 an hour. Uh, subsidies for childcare get cut all the time and at a fraction of what they need to be for folks to get good daycare or childcare. Um, it's harder than ever to get health insurance and the health insurance markets are being roiled by our own federal government right now. So jobs are tougher, benefits are on the way down. Um, it's, it's harder, much harder to find good union, stable, long-term jobs. Um, so that it's, it's not just folks who are renting aren't building up equity and aren't getting a deduction, however limited it might be now, for, uh, for, for paying you know, mortgage interest. It's also that their costs uh, are going up all over the place. Um, you know, the overall inflation rate is very low, but that's, that's largely because uh, technology prices keep falling. You know, computers, cell phones, big screen TVs. Food and housing prices are not going down so much. So we're in a situation now where 39% of households in this town pay more than 30% of their income uh, for housing costs, and that doesn't include taxes. So, uh, you know, people, people are, there's, there's reasons why people are caught in a vise, and, and um, yeah, it, it's tough, but, but the numbers are pretty stark. Mayor Jackson, I want to give you the opportunity to respond to that too. Uh, yes, just, just a couple of things. One, um, Brianna, you mentioned a notion of catching up, and I think it's important to note that when you say catch up, some of the other towns are catching up from their actual responsibility under COA. What we're talking about is catching up because we have aspirational goals to do far beyond what we were taught what we have to do for COA. So we are, um, and the reason that we're in that, we don't have to, we're exempt from participating in the COA process is because we've done so much relative to the, the numbers that we were assigned uh, via that COA process. So other communities are catching up, but they're catching up from, you know, from, from, from not doing anything. And we're catching up to a, more, to a higher goal because we, we, we believe as a community that we want to do more. The other thing I want to touch on too is a lot of it is talked about the growth. And for, for the most part, the growth that we're talking about, we have three projects in Montclair that are being addressed right now. We have Lackawanna Plaza, which will be about 150 units, the Seymour Street development, which will be about 200 units, and Valley and Bloom, which is already up, which is another 250 units. So that's 400, uh, 600 units. This is the growth that, you know, the, the, the much, the, this sort of ominous growth that we're talking about. We're talking about three developments along Bloomfield Avenue um, that have been, that are, that we're talking about. And, um, and it's important to note that all of them are on the main corridor. We have, in fact, as part of a policy, reduced density in most of the rest of town, but said we're going to, whatever growth we're going to have, we're going to have it along the main corridor because it's walkable, uh, um, uh, water sewer are already there, um, so it's economically, uh, I should say ecologically uh, friendly. The other thing too I just want to, we have to keep in mind is, for most of the 30s and 40s, Montclair had a population of 40,000 people, uh, and it peaked in 1970 at 44,000 people. So we now have a population of 39,000. So when we talk about growth, we're actually 5,000 5, people less than we were in 1970. So this notion that we're you know, bursting at the seams and so forth is really not, uh, in fact, accurate. Um, we are much less than we were um, many years ago. Uh, and uh, I just want to be clear that we keep some of these notions in perspective because some of it is, is I think, you know, skewed and not being accurately portrayed. Councilman, and then Ann will come right to you. Yes, thank you. Um, so for full disclosure, I'd just like to state for the record that I work extremely close with Mr. Keating and the Alice population. I'm the council liaison to the Senior Citizens Advisory Commission, so I work very close in advocacy with Ann Mappel. I'm, I've also been advocating and working <laughs> with Mr. Pelham for many, many years with the MNDC population and Mr. Scott with the Affordable Housing. I'm on the Affordable Housing Commission She's for the busy Township. Lady. No, but I, there's a reason that I say that, because it's important that the people that are watching that don't 
listen to someone saying that we're doing nothing and act as though all the people on the council are insensitive or any of the people on the council are insensitive to the needs because I certainly have dedicated my entire life to working for the same population. Mr. Scott mentioned a 3,000 person applicant uh, waiting list for affordable housing in the township of Montclair and again the important thing about that is that that's, those are regional uh, people that are coming here and while I certainly would like to be able to afford and have affordable housing for all the people in the, in the region, I think by the latest policies that we're implementing in the township of Montclair, we're going to begin to put a dent in the affordable needs for our Montclair residents as well as our senior residents. We're discussing the needs of the senior residents. We've made some changes in terms of um, dwellings and usage of dwellings so that seniors can now have someone living in, in their home for certain specific needs. So we're not, their concerns are not unlike our concerns. I think the majority of the people on the council, and specifically I can speak for myself, I, I share their concerns and we are moving forward um, with some of those things. Even when we're not creating um, as many units as I would like to see at times, we're doing things like extending affordability on units that are already there. So if the time is up and someone's living in an affordable unit, then rather than just say, hey, you know, you've got to go on, we are offering opportunities to, to extend the affordability. I'm not opposed to looking further into um, some type of stabilization for rents. Uh, so far, other than people just saying, you know, we want rent stabilization, no one has presented recently. We do have a document that we looked at from years past, but no one has presented to me recently some specifics that say, we've done, you know, some, some data and this is what we need. Other than um, a group of students at our Montclair High School that I'm, I'm very excited about, Mr. Jeff Freeman, his social justice class actually was the first group that came in before the council and they had very specific recommendations and we listened. I'd like to get a copy of that and, and see that. So yeah, you know, a lot of people are saying, you know, we need rent control, we need rent stabilization. I would like to, to be a part of that discussion moving forward to see the numbers, to see what it looks like and to actually have some meat behind just saying that that's what we want. And I think that um, I'd like to applaud our Montclair High School students, just like students are leading the way in activities against gun violence. Again, we have students right here in Montclair leading the way in terms of some actions that we may actually be able to look at for stabilizing some of the rents. Well, and we know that that action can take time. The Lackawanna Plaza project is a good example of that as it's been um, trying to, be, to move forward and, and it's hitting some roadblocks. But Anne, um, before you begin, I also want to just remind our audience, if you have questions, we'll start to open it up so that after Anne is finished, if you have questions, you can start stepping up to the microphone and we'll open it up to the community as well. Go ahead, Anne. I want to um, confirm what uh, Dr. Baskerville has said about some incremental changes on the community level that have actually um, started to change the landscape. Those things like accessory dwelling units in single family houses where you can have a caregiver or a relative stay, you might be able to um, help defer, defer, defer some tax um, issues that way. Um, we also are looking at the concepts of um, multi, um, well, single family, I guess it's duplexes. It's where um, a senior citizen will be on the lower level and upper level will have a full um, house that uh, a family might be able to, to live in. So the zoning is being looked at in, in terms of inclusion. But I'd like to assert that there are just so many things we can do on the community level and that there are things that the state is actually looking at now. I've been participating on a task force which is trying to figure out what the state can do to help alleviate problems, especially for seniors. Our demographics are changing. 20% of New Jerseyans will be over the age of 60 in 20 years, and we cannot just turn a blind eye on, to their needs. So when we talk about rents, we have to think about the landlords. We have to think about incentivizing the landlords so that they will be willing to give long-term releases. This is not the same thing as rent control. We have to think about developing a statewide fund where a landlord can borrow against that fund 
to retrofit an apartment for universal design so seniors can live there. We have to think about a number of other approaches at the state level where we try to get health insurance companies to work with municipal companies to build housing that is supportive of senior living. These are things that have to be done on a much broader level. We can be the stimulus for this, but we can't bring it about. The last thing that we want to see the state do is to come up with some sort of a cap on the taxes for people who live in single family homes who are over the age of 60. There are many states that have adopted this and it is a very effective way of keeping seniors in their homes. And what's the population in Montclair made up of seniors? What's the percentage here? Um, I think it's about 7,000 right now, um, but it's going up very quickly. Um, Out of the roughly, Mayor, Mayor Jackson, 40,000 or so residents. Yes. I'll just turn and, and we will get back to the panelists. Um, Councilman at large, Bob Russo, he has a question for you. Yes, my question is also a, a question about the solution. I think I have a solution and serving on the council with Mayor Jackson and Councilwoman Baskerville, we've all been grappling with school costs, even though the Board of Ed is separate from us, but we have a tax bill that's 55% schools, and everybody's burdened with these property taxes. So what I'm asking and what I'd like to say is that I support what the governor is trying to do, which would be to give Montclair and many other communities a much larger grant of school aid than we have, which would help reduce property taxes. And the only way that can happen is we have to have higher taxes on those who can afford to pay them. And those are the millionaires. And Montclair is filled with wonderful millionaires, with wonderful big homes. And I know so many of them that don't mind paying a little bit more in their income tax in order to get the entire town to have a reduction in property taxes. So the idea of property tax reduction through a millionaire's tax is what I would like to ask all of you to, to address because that to me is the solution for affordability in Montclair. Millionaires tax statewide, more state aid for our schools, reduce our property taxes, which are 55% school driven. Well, the, we've heard of first mentions of state government uh, in the last couple of minutes. And it's important to realize this entire debate over the past 15 or so years has been taking place in the context of a state government, particularly under Governor Christie, that was slashing aid to Montclair year after year after year, while passing taxes, while raising the state deficits, squeezing out any chance for interesting policy initiatives. We've known the population is aging for a long time. You know, it was a state government that decided or, or was incapable uh, of doing anything about it until now. So now we're closer to a crisis. It's because, you know, for 15 years, the state government actively fought meeting a, the, court, the, the court mandate the courts mandated how much affordable housing needed to be built to meet, to, to meet the requirements of the state constitution. And instead of complying, the state government fought that for more than a decade. So that's, that's why things are as far along downhill as they are now. So, I mean, before even talking about policy specifics, I'm just really glad to see that there are some policies on the table. Because for eight years, it was, uh, it, it was pur purposeful denial of educational aid to Montclair which put a stranglehold on, on local decision making. And we have a new governor who wants to rectify that. Yes. Mayor Jackson, do you want to address uh, Bob Russo's question regarding the millionaire's tax and, and maybe the, the counterpoint that, that some other municipalities have said, which is the worry that then folks will leave or, or um, not come and, and seek residency here as well? I, I think that's, a, that's an issue um, of people leaving, you know, the tax is already high and exacerbated by the fact of this deductibility issue, uh, which has hit uh, so hard. Uh, personally, I, I'm more partial to uh, State President uh, Sweeney's uh, proposal to uh, increase the corp some corporate taxes um, to provide the same amount of income. Um, and, and maybe there's some hybrid in there somewhere between the millionaire's tax and the corporate tax. but. Um, if you read the, the, the whole notion of the millionaire's tax, I think some people in this audience might be surprised to find out that they're millionaires um, in terms of who's going to get taxed. And so to me, I mean, we're not, we're not you know, you got to read it and sort of make sure that the people who are really millionaires, because some people, I think, I've, I've read one version where it's like if you make $200,000, you're a millionaire. I mean, 
Well, no, the, the governor has but, specifically but said only a million dollars and above. But I'm saying yeah. some of the earlier versions that right. were done no, before, you're right. You're right. you know, if you made, and so what I'm saying is that we just have to make yeah, sure absolutely. that the tax yeah. is actually on, on, on people income. who are at a certain, right. certain level. No, yes. you're right, Mayor. Does anyone else want to address Bob Russo's question? I, um, I, I'm somewhere between both the mayor and Bob Russo. I, I think that um, it would be really good for us to explore both um, millionaire taxes further as well as corporate taxes and the school funding. So I think between looking at all three of them and coming up with some type of blend there, it certainly would be a start. Well, we're going to circle back to the, the housing you. issue. Thank you, Bob. Um, but I do also have a question from one member of the, uh, the community here, and I hope that I'm reading this correctly. Give us a bit of history of the master plan. Um, how long ago, and is it online to review? Uh, I would like to, and I can start out the conversation. Yeah. Yes, the, the town completed its uh, revision of its master plan, I believe it was 2015. 16. 16. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a, at least a three-year process, a lengthy process. Mm -hmm. But it did have quite a bit of community input, uh, several uh, town meetings, uh, planning board review, uh, and, and it really had to take into consideration uh, the, the, the overall growth of the town, uh, specifically from a residential standpoint, a commercial standpoint. Um, one thing that I was very interested in, the, uh, the first versions of the master plan was uh, a possible growth uh, in housing units, and the, and the number was around 35, 33, 3,600 units. And uh, of course, if we were going to be generating those units throughout the entire township, uh, all four wards, uh, a lot of that development was going to take place around all the different train stations, the six train stations within the township. Uh, of course, that first version did not fly very far, okay? Uh, and as I mentioned, it was about a three-year process. Uh, just, and I'll probably let Councilwoman and the, the Mayor chime in, just looking at the current development from uh, uh, Orange Road and Bloomfield Avenue down to uh, Bloomfield Avenue and Maple Street, Maple Avenue, and that really is the uh, Central Business uh, Area and the Eastern Gateway areas. Those are the areas that they refer to. Moving forward, probably by 20, uh, 2020, 2015, well, excuse me, 2020, and a few years after that, we may have, based on the amount of development that has been approved, that's underway, uh, we'll probably have about 1,100 units, uh, housing units, right within that corridor. And I'll even include the hotel. And the reason I include the hotel because uh, you're going to have a hotel with about 150 uh, units basically in it. And in order for that hotel to be uh, profitable, you've got to maintain uh, that population at least at 85 to 90%. So really you've got another population that's gonna be within the township on a regular basis, a daily basis, even though they're temporary they're going to be amongst their residents for whatever the time period might be. So, you know, uh, I, I think the issue with the master plan, it, it did not really move the development uh, in a balanced way throughout the entire township of Montclair, uh, even though they did move it forward. That, that was just one of my concerns. But I, I just wanted to go back and, and touch bases on some of the policies that we have just updated in the town's inclusionary zoning ordinance and also in its affordable housing ordinance because they're, they're, they're relevant. Uh, from a standpoint, uh, the inclusionary zoning ordinance, any development from a private developer standpoint, uh, areas of redevelopment or areas of uh, need of redevelopment, we will be making a commitment to have a 20% set aside for affordable housing. That was not the case in, in the past. Uh, those commitments have been reduced to uh, at least by 50 to 10%, 50% there. So moving forward, we're going to be making sure that those policies, those areas are going to be included. Also, uh, some of the additional policy changes that we've made in the affordable housing uh, ordinance, we will be, uh, and 
and I think Councilwoman Bassman touched on it a little bit there, uh, any area, any particular unit that needs to be rehabbed, uh, we are going to provide the uh, owner of that property uh, up to $15,000 to continue to keep that unit uh, affordable, but we will provide funding for them to do that. And also, we have another program to uh, extend the affordable controls on a unit uh, uh, in addition to uh, uh, up to $15,000 to support that as well. And, and, and we, we want to make sure we maintain the inventory we have while we add to the inventory with some of the new development. So we, we are moving forward uh, trying to make sure that the, we are putting new policies in place to maintain at least the population of affordable units we have in place. There's also been some effort to remove some of these vacant properties as well um, and, and move those forward and, and provide funding for that. Mayor Jackson, did you want to, uh, uh, I'll come to you and then I'll come to you, Councilwoman. Yes, and also, I want to make sure someone addresses part of that question regarding the master plan was, is it online to review? And so I want to make sure we answer it that. Yes. It is. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I just wanted to, just to, if I take a second, what Mr. Scott said, the monies that Mr. Scott referred to are coming from the balanced housing fund, which is a fund that's contributed to by developers mm -hmm. uh, in the case when they don't, they have to book a half a unit or something like that. So if it's not possible, they contribute dollars into a fund, and that fund is used to pay for the, uh, the improvements that Mr. Scott was uh, referring to earlier. Um, uh, in terms of the, um, I'm sorry, what's the question? Well, well, so we're talking about some of the new policies for affordable housing, and I also would like oh, to the, ask the, the, the vacancy and the, the vacancy. Yeah. But we, there was also talk about designating some of those affordable housing units for township employees, folks who work here. Where does that stand as well? If you could uh, address that in your response too. Uh, an, an employee uh, program for our uh, municipal employees, teachers, um, is, a, is a vital part of the overall affordable housing program that we, that, and, that tw and that 20 percent number we're working aggressive, including some uh, uh, housing for our uh, employees so they can stay in town. That's a, that's a key component. And we've also talked to uh, some banks uh, who have properties in town that uh, we could possibly work with them to get to, to acquire some properties or have them turn into uh, affordable housing. So we're looking at a whole a plethora of, of, of tools in our in our toolkit to try to make uh, affordable housing work. Um, and uh, we're going to you know experiment a little bit and see how it happens. And I think I think we'll get there because there isn't one way of getting to affordable housing. There are a number of ways, and um, uh, working with the vacant housing is, is is one of them. Councilwoman, and then Anne will come right to you. So uh, regarding you know what what exactly is a master plan? It's it's um it's a blueprint and it is a uh, planning document that um, is to be used for the purpose of ensuring public health and safety and promoting an overall welfare sense of well-being in a community and it consists of many many parts um, and that from from commercial all the way down to environment open space and most recently they're working on a, a sustainable component so there are many components of that and the thing that um, we often use it for in the township is um, to make sure that we preserve the the neighborhoods and in there we spent many many I guess years really um, doing a, a re-examination of the master plan and we included everybody in the community that wanted to participate in it we, we included the business districts business owners we included the um, residents of course here and whoever wanted to be in, involved our public safety and we listened to all of their concerns before we came up and adopted, and I'm saying we because this is a, a document that is adopted by the planning board, and we received their comments and we adjusted things uh, that needed to happen. For example, one of the things that we heard time and again, Mr. Scott, Mr. Pelham um, were there, is that we wanted to preserve the character of our neighborhoods. Many people were fearful that as development occurred in the township, that uh, we would lose some of the character of our residential neighborhoods. And so one of the concerted efforts in the re-examination was to put things in place to make sure that while we identified transit villages very near to the train station and afforded an opportunity for increased density in those areas, that we preserved the wonderful tree-lined streets and whatever the character of the neighborhoods are that people so value because one of the things that I value most about Montclair is that 
we all have pride in our community. We walk around Montclair pride. And that can be, some people may not even understand, you know, why people that live in, in a certain area have as much pride about their neighborhood as they do. Some people may think, you know, that if you don't have a million dollar mansion or McMansion in Montclair, that, you know, maybe something is wrong. But those of us that grew up here that understand the history, we've gone through a lot of effort to, to conserve that history. And so part of the examination looked into all of those parts as well as commercial use and um, you name it, open space. So could I ask you a question else. about that? Yeah. yeah. Um, given all that, mm -hmm. um, could, could you just talk about, or Mr. Mayor, maybe you could, about town initiatives that help the folks in those neighborhoods, help folks who are Alice, below Alice income levels, um, apart from housing. I mean, ho housing is an issue which, which rent control may happen, it may be voted down, it may never come to a vote, we're not sure, but we do know housing costs are going up in the interim, right? And, and there are things that we can do to alleviate the, 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 the costs of living and help the quality of life for people who are facing housing costs. Um, for example, alleviating childcare or providing pre-K um, costs would be, would be an example. But I know a lot of folks here have been involved with, with initiatives to do that. For example, um, vouchers for folks to pay less at the green markets, you know? Um, Point, could you just point me or point us towards things that the town is already doing or could do to help alleviate those cost of living issues for folks who are struggling and who want to stay in those neighborhoods? And Albert and Ann, I want to make sure we bring you in on that as well, but go ahead, Councilwoman. Okay, um, so uh, one, of, one of the things that I guess that comes immediately to mind is in, when we did the studies and we looked out to uh, 2035 and what the projections are, um, is anticipated with, with some of the development that that certainly will bring jobs into the township of Montclair. And even looking on a municipal level, time and again, uh, most of uh, our council agrees that all things being equal, where we can offer a job to a municipal individual, somebody that's resident in the township with all things equal, that we should consider those things. I, um, we're not now, there's no mandate, for example, for our public safety individuals right now to, to reside within the township. I certainly, you know, would be in favor of, of looking at that and moving towards that. But for as much as all things are equal, we've already, you know, had discussions about the fact that we want to, um, you know, offer opportunities for jobs in the township as they expand. So that's one of the things that um, immediately comes to my mind. Mr. Mayor? Uh, yeah, a couple things, uh, 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 Peter. We, we're offering, uh, uh, Ann referenced this earlier, travel vouchers so that people can get back and forth uh, more cheaply than they would have otherwise. Discounts with Easy Pass providing uh, some uh, cab, uh, uh, much, much less expensive cab travel. Uh, we also provide food vouchers uh, for people at the, um, uh, at the markets, at the farmers markets, so that, that people can take advantage of those. Um, I know that the, uh, the bid uh, is, is offering um, um, uh, farmers markets as well as well, of course, the one we have on Walnut Street. The other thing that we're doing as well is, uh, in terms of quality of life, is that's why some of the infrastructure work that we're doing is so important. You know, it's, it's for all of us, when we come out of our houses and we see that our, that our streets are, are, are look good, are paved, um, you know, and, and they look, it, it causes all of us, I think, to take even further pride uh, in our neighborhoods. And we're doing, we're ensuring that all of our neighborhoods get um, upgraded um, so that the quality of life just being around. We're also investing heavily in our parks so that when kids go to um, our parks now, that they're able to, you know, the, 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 the equipment that they're on and, and the appearance of the parks um, look better. Because some people obviously can't get to um, more lavish uh, vacation spots and things like that. So. The, the things that we do, providing for the, the overall infrastructure in our community, providing for uh, improvement of our parks, I think people are going to be amazed when uh, we turn the key on Edgemont Park in, in the next uh, 30 days or so, what's going on there. And hopefully that will that'll go on to some of our other parks as well. Um, so all those things, I think, provide for the quality of life. Um, we're uh, actually increasing um, things as simple in, in our town, just things like collecting litter. I mean, we've gone to big, I think you've all seen these big belly um, trash cans around that have dramatically uh, in, in, improved the, uh, the uh, litter uh, issue in some of our business districts and some around some of our parks. We're going to be adding some of those. 
Um, we just got a new, a new sweepers that we're going to introduce to try to help us keep areas around town and our parks and our business districts clean as well. So all those things, cleanliness, um, uh, upkeep of our communities, all contribute to quality of life, um, and, and hopefully that will uh, you know, help us make things better. And, and food. And, yeah, and food, I think, is, is very important. And, and we certainly um, are partners with many organizations on any given day, individuals that feel that there's a food scarcity in their home or people that would just like a meal. We provide them. We are partnered with um, so many nonprofits, as most of the people in the panel know, and others. And we've also uh, increased our um, abilities for people to have gardening opportunities so that they can grow their own food. So we're, we're providing healthy food choices um, in, in local areas. One of them is right on Miller Street um, in, in the fourth ward of Montclair um, in, in an area that historically has not been the most affluent area. And so we're providing um, a lot of opportunities for people to, to know that they can come in and they can get uh, food. We also provide um, opportunities for people if they need um, household goods. We have an organization that we're working very close for now, a nonprofit in a township, that if someone calls up or someone's looking for a couch or something like that, then go, we work collaboratively with all of these organizations to try to make sure that, that we meet the needs as much as possible. And I want to give you an opportunity. I want to expand the conversation a little bit. There is um, a problem for many seniors who live in town. They are asset rich, but income poor. They do not qualify for affordable housing. They don't come into the Alice um, uh, uh, category. These are people who are just deserving of our attention. And there are things that we can do to keep them here. These people actually can add a lot of value to our, our township. There is something called the grandparent economy. It's $3 billion worth nationally, which means that seniors shop locally, and they volunteer locally, and they're the donor class in their churches and houses of worship. If we can't find a way to provide financially sustainable as opposed to affordable housing, we're going to lose these seniors. And there are, I think, some strategies for financial sustainability. One of the things that happens here in Montclair is senior freeze, which is a state program. Most seniors here don't qualify for it because their incomes are too high. So we've got to get some more elasticity on that. The other thing is that we worked with Nia Gill um, three years ago to develop a program that was modeled after um, Massachusetts. We called it the tax work-off pro program, where if, if seniors volunteered in town, they could actually be given credit for a certain amount of work, and that would be deducted from their property tax at a future year. This bill came to Trenton. It was passed by both houses, and it was vetoed by Governor Christie. This is not slave labor. This is seniors with a lot of talent offering their services to the township for maybe IT upgrades, for event management, for some of the things that I do I'd like to get some recognition for. So we'd like <laughs> to see the, um, the conversation with respect to seniors shifting away from affordable to what I'm calling financially sustainable. And Albert, let's broaden beyond that because we're also talking about generations of minority families leaving um, affordability issues, obviously, at, at the foremost. So what strikes me of interest when you talk about quality of life, within one mile of the path mark is probably the largest population of poor people in this community, yet they don't even have a supermarket to go to. We've been talking about this for four years or, yeah, four years or longer. Yeah. So it's great that we have nice uh, restaurants. restaurants and we have uh, you know, nice garbage cans in the town. For some, that's a great quality of life. Well, if you, but you live within a mile and you're poor, you don't have a supermarket to go to, 
I mean, how sad is that for a township of Montclair that we're drawing people from all over the place to come to this great process, but for the underserved population of this community, hey, to me, it's just sad. It's frustrating and sad. Yes. And for, our, for our viewers who are watching via online, we're talking about the Lackawanna uh, train station, this whole uh, complex where there have been plans in the works uh, to replace a, a supermarket uh, or, or other ideas to use that space, but we haven't yet seen that come through. William? And, and yes, just, just to add to that, you know, I'm, I'm also a, a landlord. I've been in the business for about 35 plus years. And, you know, I've got uh, professionals uh, as tenants, uh, blue collar workers as tenants. And believe me, it's, it's a struggle for them to maintain the uh, increases that I've been giving them over the years, which basically um, would fall within a rent control structure. And, you know, it's, it's very important for people to understand, you know, we're, we're not talking about, you know, everyone thinks about poor people. You know, this is, this is the, we've got a large working class population in the township of Montclair that's living check by check. And, you know, I've, I've been very sensitive not to, you know, force any tenants out. I've tried to work with uh, my tenants. Uh, I'm not a millionaire, I can tell you that for sure. I haven't made a lot of money over the last 35 years working with this, but you have to understand you're in the same boat with people, uh, whether you're a landlord or a tenant. Uh, you're just really trying to make ends meet and trying to be uh, thoughtful enough to keep uh, uh, tenants in your uh, units without a lot of turnover and, and, and transient. And, and also giving the uh, landlord the uh, possible and the capability of doing, you know, their capital improvements and things of that nature. So all these t types of uh, concerns would be a part of the conversation. How do we maintain uh, the, the level of increases that still provides the landlords with the opportunity to make money? It is a business. There's no getting well, around. We've got to find ways to yeah. put more money back into the people, uh, the pockets of people who are keeping up their end of the bargain. So if, if you're working, yes. So, 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 I mean, uh, since since deductibility of taxes and a millionaire's tax and these things and a new administration, all these things are on the table. We should take advantage of this time to restructure the sources of revenue and, uh, and, and the destinations of revenue at the state. And the number one thing we should do is increase as, as much as humanly possible the earned income tax credit. This is a tax credit that is refunded. You file your taxes because you're working and money comes back to you instead of you paying taxes. A large chunk of it doesn't go to folks because they don't realize they're eligible because you have to file for it. We try to help people with that through our tax prep program. But in general, while New Jersey has a pretty high rate compared to a lot of states, we could be a pioneering leader in this. We could devote some of those resources that we're talking about at the state level and redirect them back to the pockets of people who are working. Enable them not just to keep their heads at level of the water, but a little bit above so that they can, you know, in, in a big sense, what we're talking about when people are insecure financially, it's not just that they can't pay their rent or they have to figure out whether to turn the lights off or keep the heat on. Those, that's, that's bad enough. But we're also talking about the ability to risk anything, because your whole life is at risk, right? To, to dream about going to a better school or to start a business or to buy your dream house. You know, the chance to invest something in your future. To do that, you need what Ann and Al and we're talking about sustainability. And that means you need to be able to pay the bills on a regular basis. And if you're working and you can't do that, or you want to work and you can't do that, you're willing to work, right? We need to find a way, and the most effective anti-poverty tool the government has ever found is the earned income tax credit. So, I mean, as far as I, and I don't speak for anybody but myself here, you could multiply that by 10, and that would help almost everything about what we're talking about right now. Mayor Jackson, you agree on the EITC? Yes, I think it's a great tool. Good. Um, okay, and I want to go back to you because we sort of um, skipped over some of the, the other issues there as far as um, meeting these needs for, for this population. So what else do you see a, as, a, as a solution then? Um, because, you know, we've talked about transportation, about some changes there. Um, we've talked a little bit in the beginning about parking and making sure that seniors have access. We don't yet have a permanent senior center, um, but, but there are some other initiatives that you're looking at as far as housing and beyond, yes? Well, um, 
I think the streetscape issue, while we're doing a lot of work on it, still needs to be um, something we attend to because pedestrian safety is a very big problem for seniors. And um, the township has uh, looked into curb cuts. It has looked into um, slowing down the traffic, what they call traffic calming um, devices. But there is still a lot of panic when people have to cross some of our wide avenues. Now, one of our issues is that many of these roads are managed by the county. And it takes a long time for um, the county to actually recognize the validity of some of these claims. But we had a victory just recently. Um, Grove Street, which is a spine of uh, Montclair, had a 35 mile per hour speed limit. And seniors reported being terribly anxious crossing that road. It turns out that children and adults had lots of problems crossing that road too. We had a town council meeting where people came out in droves. Well, the township kept plugging at this and finally the town council um, brought this to the county and the county has agreed to change the um, miles per hour to 30. We think that's a major victory and a start in terms of recognizing pedestrian safety. But you did speak about the comprehensive senior center, and I think that that's another very important issue that we have to um, work on. This council has already made it very clear that they support a bricks and mortar senior center. It's long overdue. And the reason it's so important is when you age in place, you know, you have different levels of competence. My uh, age group is still very able to get around and, uh, and fend for themselves, but you reach a level where you may need a little bit more support, a more, little more network. And you have to have a go-to place where the seniors can get the information and the support they need. We've used all sorts of digital communications. We've uh, innovated with um, email distribution, websites, online news, newsletters, paper newsletters. What really works is word of mouth. And until you have a comprehensive senior center, people do not find out what they need to find out in a timely way. Well, and Peter, you talked about bringing folks in so that you could um, sort of assist them in getting the aid and getting signed up for different aspects. So does not having a, a hub like that hinder your ability to reach out to that portion of the community? Well, one of the signature programs we do is, uh, is, called, is through a caregivers coalition where we support and bring together and support caregivers of all kinds. And it's interesting when we have caregivers meetings that usually take place at the Verona Community Center because we need a central hub to be able to do that in this town. And I, uh, I, I am working hard with United Way to try to help meet, meet those needs because our local board identified that as a critical need um, and, and has continued to for the past couple of years. And I want to remind our audience, if you have any questions, please um, send them Selma and Deb will grab your cards or feel free to step up to the microphone and, and ask the questions as well, if anyone wants to, because we are getting toward the last half hour or so of the forum. Eight minutes. <laughs> my, the, first, the first number on my clock was covered on my phone. Um, Albert and William, I just want to come back to you to talk about, because we are here, of course, to try to engage solutions and talk about, of course, the positives and, and the challenges that are being presented, but solutions, ultimately, to some of these barriers. So when we talk about the composition, uh, we only touched on it earlier, uh, the, the local high school, I think someone said it was 25% African American now, the composition is changing, we're seeing these families leave. What are the barriers? Is it um, jobs are not, there readily, the transportation is not there to bring access. Um, you spoke about the you know, path mark being gone. We have a food desert in that particular ward. So what then um, is the major challenge you see um, bringing barriers to these families and what is your solution? It's, again, to me, the biggest challenge are folks not being able to afford to, to live in this community. Um, and to me, that's the bottom line. I think the relationship that we have with the town council, and with the various organizations, people want to work together to make a difference. But until we can stabilize 
rents, for folks to be able to afford to stay in the town, that is the big issue for me. And again, I deal with the underserved population of the community, and I'm just being their voice for this evening. William? Uh, matter of fact, I probably have a question for the, the mayor and, and Councilwoman Bassett. But moving forward, if we have any particular developments that involve township property, should we be able to request, uh, from an economic development standpoint, uh, the owners of those projects to employ uh, a percentage of the Montclair residents? Uh, if, we're, if we're using a township asset, then we should have a little bit more leverage saying what we should be expecting uh, from that developer. You know, I know we've looked at uh, 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 pilot programs and things of that nature, but I think that we could uh, add a little bit more to those uh, agreements to maybe uh, seek some additional employment for township employees, uh, township residents. And we've seen community investment agreements work elsewhere. Um, you know, a lot of talk happened in, in Camden when big developments were coming there and, and there were incentives added into those so that they would invest in, in, in their areas. Albert, we'll come back to you. Yeah, yeah real quick. Um, and we talked about this with the mayor and Dr. Baskerville maybe four years ago, but one of the things that we talked about was if a supermarket comes into town, we should make sure that a nonprofit, could be MNDC, mine, or whatever, would have the responsibility of hiring and training township people to get those jobs first. If we do that, then that, that brings more jobs in the community and maybe stable our people leaving. Peter, I see those you. Are the kind, those are the kind of jobs that are hard to come by. Those are skilled jobs. It's a trade. Uh, a lot of the jobs are unionized, and, um, and that that would be that would be tremendous. I mean, I, in general, I know that the town tries to use its leverage, but I mean, you know, we're a civic leader, we're a thought leader, and um, I, it would be great to see the town use as much leverage as possible to not just serve underserved elements of the population with social services, but to bring um, particular kinds of development, like especially the Lackawanna Plaza. Well, and that was just discussed at last night's meeting. So, um, Mayor, uh, Councilwoman, just bring us up to speed very quickly there on what was discussed last night um, to move forward. Um, in terms of Lackawanna? Yes. Um, and so, at Tuesday evening's meeting, the Council passed a resolution that um, we're very much in favor of moving forward post-haste to um, proceed with the uh, latest proposal that the developer of that pro uh, property has before us, and um, we unanimously supported that. And, and I, I also am, am very concerned and disturbed by the fact that there's been no grocery store in that location for going on four years in November. And we can't take the responsibility solely for that within the council. There's a lot of things that delayed it initially um, the, the neighbors and the community wanted a municipal complex, and so we spent a lot of time looking at that, trying to develop a municipal complex. At that time, it was a redevelopment project, and so we certainly had more control over things than, than we do at this time. Somewhere throughout the last four years, the developer decided that they no longer wanted to do a redevelopment uh, plan with us, that they wanted to go ahead and develop their property. As, as the owner of the property, and that gives us less control over everything regarding that property. It's just like if somebody comes to your house and tries to dictate to you that you have to put a supermarket now or else. So things got a little bit more complicated. Can I, uh, I, I there, there wasn't actually a note, check me if I'm wrong, but Montclair has, has increased the number, the percentage of um, housing units that have to be affordable in new developments. And, and has there been a drop off in, or was there any negative reaction that was really bad from developers? Developers are still developing there, even though we basically doubled the percentage of units that have to be okay. affordable, right? So, no. And so our inclusionary zoning ordinance for many, many years has been 20% um, affordable units for all new development. Um, in the past few years, developers have um, given us um, some payment 
payments uh, that would go into the trust fund or agreed to maintain affordability on other units and so we were not meeting that 20% in, in the past near, near years, although there were other compensations that were being made. So we didn't increase anything. The 20%, we are just recommitting to, to staying. And so a note on the positive side in terms of that developer, um, the developer, as soon as Mr. Scott and others came um, to discuss the importance of having affordable units there and, and keeping them at 20%, percent the developer had no problems with it there was no negative uh, feedback that I was aware of and immediately agreed to maintaining 20% um, affordable units in that new development and so um, that along with the fact that we have it's long overdue for a grocery store in that neighborhood uh, encouraged many of us on the council to want to to have a voice and to let um, people know that you know enough is enough it's, it's we and I am very much in Councilman, favor. Councilman, I just want to make sure that we let our audience members Good. get their questions okay. to okay. you. So we'll come to you. Just give us your name, and if there's someone specifically you'd like to address the question otherwise to the panel. Uh, my name is Deirdre Malloy, and anyone can answer this question. And most of you already know that the requirement to hire from within the community is called Section 3. Is there an opportunity, perhaps, to speak with developers about their Section 3 requirements so that we can get a better understanding? And also, some of those job descriptions do require specific skill sets, but there are opportunities where some people in the community can be hired to do other kind of labor type things. So is there an opportunity to discuss with developers their Section 3 requirements? Mayor Jackson, would you like to address it first? I, I I would simply have you say yes. Really, yes. Yeah. Councilwoman? Um, I agree with that. And in addition to um, hiring locally, I certainly would like to um, have discussions that would encourage hiring minorities and, and females um, in every step of the way in terms of the development, in terms of um, being employed with the opportunities there, and, and all of the uh, populations that have historically been left out or underserved in terms of job opportunities. Does anyone else want to address that before we go to the next question? Okay, sir, just give us your name and, and go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is John Minus. Um, I live on New Street, so I guess I, that's the area we're talking is at the fourth work. Like, I'm relatively new here. I'm going on my fourth year living in Montclair, and I really like it here. Um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm like firmly in that middle class area, but my rent has gone up $150 in two years. Um, in the last three years, when I moved into my building, I was the new person, and a year and a half later, I'm the oldest person there. Like, everybody left. So, um, I, I know we were talking about, I you know we don't like to use the G word, but like that gentrification is gonna be happening, and I, I'm like, like I said, I'm middle class. I should be, I, I should be able to live on my own. But I feel like if one more year of rent increases, and I'm going to have to move out. And like I said, I'm not rich, but I like the where I'm at. I should be able to not to live on my own. And I don't want to leave leave here. I like my Claire, but you know, even I'm worried about it. So I can imagine, like you know, I've been, you know, I kind of still am, but I've been in that really, you know, ten dollar an hour job area. And I can't imagine if I was still there. There was no way I'd be able to even think about living here. So I don't know if that's anything anybody can control, but it's it's a real problem, and not just for like the you know poverty line people, but like mi middle middle class people, you know, are one rent increase away from not being able to live here. So. Albert, that's what you had mentioned mm -hmm. before. Yes, I mean, although you work with the population, um, that that is making that minimum wage in the last year. Hearing that elsewhere. I, mean, I, I hear his story every day. I mean, people come into my area or my office every day with the same story. And so, don't want to be the dead horse, but rent stabilization is the only way that's going to stop that from happening. And that's it. So, Councilwoman, here's a constituent who's saying, I'm working, I'm, I'm middle class, and I'm not gonna, going to be able to afford to stay here much longer if this rate continues. 
And, and, and I also hear that um, every day, just as Mr. Pelham, and um, certainly, again, I, I don't think that we're, um, we haven't given the um, opportunity, uh, the, the vetted it fully in terms of putting um, some types of stab stabilizations in place for people that are there. In terms of how much can um, people increase the rent, I know that now there are state guidelines and um, we're, we're working under those state guidelines, but I do think that it would be well um, worth it and, and incumbent upon us to take a look at what else we can do to make sure that people that don't qualify for affordable housing by the guidelines per se, but are in a lower um, income bracket can remain in the township. And I think that that's where looking at some of the proposals like the um, class from the high school and the other things that I'm working on with Mr. Um, Scott would really play a big role there. Okay, uh, we have time for another question. Uh, go right ahead. Uh, hi, um, my name is Deborah Kagan. I'm president of Bike Walk Montclair and I'm also a member of the Pedestrian Safety Advisory Committee in Montclair. Um, so I wanted to just follow up uh, on Anne's comment about the streetscape um, and talk that's a, a question mainly for our, our council uh, members and our mayor. Um, Montclair uh, in 2009 was a leader in the state um, in passing a complete streets resolution, mm -hmm. um, which we are very proud of. Um, and since then, there have been some challenges, I think. Um, we do be on developing the infrastructure to implement some of those complete street um, initiatives. Um, so, because Complete Streets uh, does touch on pedestrian safety, the use of the streets for multimodal, um, it crosses equity issues, environmental issues, health issues, um, all of which touch on quality of life, um, which we're talking about here. Um, and what the, the research and the towns that have uh, progressed with this, have done, have implemented infrastructure to address some of these issues. Um, and we currently have a plan uh, that's before the planning committee um, that was developed with uh, funding from the Department of Transportation um, with some suggestions and tools uh, identifying a network for biking and walking more in our town called the Montclair Safe Plan. Um, and it's kind of, I believe, in sort of a limbo state. So uh, without going specifically into the planning board or that process, I'd really like to hear um, from our council members and anybody else um, sort of what your approach, your ideas, your advice uh, for us as a town to move forward uh, on this issue. Mayor Jackson, we'll come to you first. Okay, um, and so I'm, I'm also very excited that our township is leading the way um, and has for a long time with Complete Streets. Um, since we started that, as you may or may not recall, we had the Bloomfield Avenue Complete Corridor Plan, and that was in, I think, um, 2015. So we looked and we had a company come in and look uh, at the Bloomfield Avenue Corridor, and so we were on top of things there. We got recommendations about things that we need to implement there. This was even before the county then followed suit and said, okay, now we're going to look at the whole stretch of Bloomfield Avenue from Newark all the way up. And so I'm really excited that as we speak tonight, they're moving forward to implement, implement some uh, safety measures along Bloomfield Avenue, which is one of the most horrific corridors for, for speeding cars in the township. What we've done in the last few years in Montclair is actually a lot in terms of traffic calming. Um, we worked very, very closely with the pedestrian safety and with Bike Walk Montclair and Bike Walk New Jersey, and we listened to their suggestions, and we hired um, experts in the area to look at the intersections and to try to make them safer. People showed crash data that demonstrated where we needed to pay more attention, and we, in fact, paid more attention in those areas. Now we have blinking lights, we have um, improved crosswalks, and we're just beginning. As um, I, Anne LaPel mentioned earlier, we, we um, spent time and evaluated the benefits of slowing the traffic on Grove Street and additional things along um, that corridor. So we're not sleeping and doing nothing. I think that we started with um, safety things. 
um, as you're aware, I'm very excited about the um, Iron and Ice or East-West Greenway um, that's, that's coming up, and so that that'll provide another opportunity for uh, pedestrian safety as well as recreation and uh, making us all a more uh, collaborative, connected community across the Hudson and um, the Pacific. So uh, there's a lot of things that, that we are doing. Mayor Jackson? Uh, yes, I, I would agree with that. Um, we have uh, we've done some interesting things uh, on um, on Park Street and uh, Mount Hebron Road. We did a raised the intersection there, which slows traffic coming down. We're looking to see how that plays out. That's a, a first one for the township. We've installed probably 25, if not 30, pairs of the of the beacons that you see, so that you can cross safely. We're going to have more of those coming. Um, we've narrowed Grove Street, narrowed Howard Harrison Avenue lower speed limits on a number of streets. So we're doing some things to really work toward um, uh, making the, st the streets a lot more safe, I think. We've got a long way to go, um, but we have done, put, we spent some money and, and put some things in place, I think, will, that will help us uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, I did have an opportunity to meet with some students down at Glenfield School, um, and I was really astounded by their sense of uh, insecurity and crossing, uh, catching buses and so forth. So. Um, it is a major issue, but I think we're, we're well on the way of uh, addressing it. Again, long way to go, but the, the, the uh, hearts are in the right place, and we're going to get it done. We're going to just shift gears to start to wrap this up. Um, William, we'll go through each of you, but I would like you to give um, our audience a few ideas of the steps that can be taken to improve quality of life, infrastructure, opportunities for Montclair residents. Well, I've been heavily involved from a uh, housing standpoint, so that's, that's kind of my, my area that I'll kind of focus on. And it was, it was very interesting with the gentleman that just uh, spoke at the, uh, the mic in regards to, you know, being a, uh, a, a middle-income family and, and, and trying to maintain his home and having to deal with the challenge of an unknown amount of rent increases on a, an annual basis. And that, that is a tremendous challenge because that's the unknown you know do you do you put that money aside uh, every year for an, an unknown increase in your rent uh, do you buy a new car do you take care of needs of your families you know whatever the case might be and I think that's the purpose of trying to understand having some sort of rent stabilization rent control we're not going to roll the rents back that's obviously not the purpose of even starting the conversation we just want to have a better handle on how to control an environment that, that quite frankly is out of control from a market rate standpoint because the market rate is just going to continue to drive those prices higher and higher so you know uh, I would say directly to you you have an opportunity we can speak offline and uh, you know take a look at our survey and you know become involved because we need people's voices like yours to you know, understand that uh, rent stabilization or rent control is an option in addition to uh, we're going to in the future be providing uh, additional and probably more affordable housing that's been uh, created in the township of Montclair over the last 10 years. So I, I think moving forward uh, from an affordable housing standpoint, we're, we're going to create some more units, but I think we need two different options. We need the uh, rent stabilization or rent control option, and we need the additional uh, affordable housing creation uh, process as well. Mr. Albert Pellman, solutions. I, I second what uh, Mr. Scott says. Um, to me, the most important thing is we have a town council that's very receptive to listening to solutions. You know, but people have to be able to be willing to come out and voice your solutions. You have to come out and be involved in the process. So what well, Mr. Scott said, I second it. You know, and I, and I think today it was a great opportunity for people to hear different viewpoints, but at the same time get involved in trying to make a difference in your own community. And we talk about an age-friendly community, about letting our seniors age in place. How do we do that moving forward? Well, there are a number of areas. I um, want to again reiterate, we're looking for financially sustainable housing. And that means finding ways to incentivize landlords to um, be friendly to senior citizens by either retrofitting or by 
actually offering multiple, multiple year leases. We're looking for some sort of way of um, forming a tax freeze on new assessments. But we also were looking for something that is akin to some of the um, conversation on affordable housing, which is a senior set aside. So we have actually gotten the Montclair preference through. If we can find a model for a senior set aside, that would also help keep seniors in, in place. And of course, a comprehensive senior center would do a lot for us. <laughs> Peter. I, I think, um, you know, Montclair doesn't have a lot of big employers. We don't have a lot of big companies here. We do have a lot of very well-off people here who run companies elsewhere, who are university presidents who make a lot of money and, and who live here. And, and I think that um, we need folks to be advocates to the extent that well-off people are directly responsible for people working, working for them, you know, in a restaurant and people work for you, or to the extent that you just get involved in local advocacy with some of the energy and passion we've seen people devote to national politics recently. But we need the well-off people. You know, people are not progressive. You're not progressive because you live in a suburb and put a lawn sign up, right? We need people to advocate for working people. We need to people to advocate for affordable housing, even if some of it happens to end up in your backyard. You know, we need to advocate for a senior center directly to the folks who are totally responsible and totally uh, willing to listen at the local level and also at the state level. We, we need to to interact more and for people to realize that their neighbors' fates are, we're all intertwined in this, first of all, because the numbers are bigger than the people of, of people struggling than we realize, but also because we're all part of the same community. But we need people with resources to vote those resources to advocacy and to some action. Councilwoman, you work hand in hand with these folks all the time. So what are you going to do now to bring those initiatives forward? And so uh, for my closing remarks, I would like to borrow from the 2018 Prevention Resource Guide, and they talk about how to develop supportive communities because everything that we've been talking about here certainly is about developing supportive communities. It's about human capital. It's about working together with our brothers as one and making sure that the least among, among us are provided for. So it says, communities have great influence in families' lives, just as plants are more likely to thrive in a garden with good soil and plenty of sunlight and water, Families are more likely to thrive in supportive communities. A safe place for children to play is one feature of a supportive community. Certainly in Montclair, we have a police force that I think is second to none. We've increased our community policing efforts so that in Montclair, we do feel as though we're one community with our police officers. Another one of the things that they say helps to make a um, supportive community is food. We're working aggressively on that. We certainly made that clear at the meeting on uh, Tuesday night. Um, don't you agree, Mr. Mayor? Absolutely. And in terms of shelter, with all the things that we put in place now, we mentioned the fact that we're in a, a great place to be in the driver's seat to make sure that not only our municipal employees, but our um, other individuals that are low, moderate income come are provided for, and medical care. The thing that struck me most about this, that they said a supportive community is one that, a culture that encourages neighbors to get to know and to help one another. And so my hope is that as we continue with the development that we don't lose that, the feel that brought most of us here, that those of us that have been here lifelong, long to have again, where you know your neighbors, you reach out and you help your neighbors. And um, so if we can, accomplish our, our development goals and maintain that help thy brother feel, then I think that we've done a great job. Mr. Mayor, so undoubtedly Montclair is, is experiencing a lot of progress, a lot of success, um, but so how do we maintain the integrity of this town, the reason why so many folks um, have pride in this town, to ensure that that stays? Um, I, I think, in, in many respects, and we've, we've talked about a bunch of initiatives and things that could happen, um, but I, I think it's important, and, and I've, I've kind of listened to the tenor a little bit tonight, and uh, I think it's important to understand that we live in a community that other people look at and just envy. And say, how do you guys do this? How do you pull this off? How do you get, you know, your AAA rating? How do you have this great uh, uh, diversity? 
how do you have the, you know, the film festival and the jazz festival? And how do you, um, you know, seem to work together, have a good school system? Uh, how do you make that happen? And um, people talk about that to, uh, all, all the time. I, I get that from my other elected officials, uh, you know, one, one gathering or another. And we have a lot to be pr proud of. This is a tremendous yeah. place to live. Are we perfect? Of course not. Do we need to do more for the, 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 those who are not doing as well in our community? Of course not, because I know that for myself, because that's where I came from. Um, this is my hometown. Sure. I was raised by a single parent who had an eighth grade education. But I, I was able to live in a town that afforded me with an opportunity to go to school, to go to high school, and go to college, and, 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 and do okay in life. Um, there are not a lot of places where that can happen, and, and people can be so supportive to make things happen. So, I mean, I, I love this place. Um, I, I'm, I'm proud to be from it. I'm proud to be able to serve on the governing body. And I think that, you know, while we certainly strive for a, a higher level of performance of our community across a whole host of parameters, Let's not forget the fact that I'm telling you that people look at us with envy. Right. They do. They think, wow, again, how do you guys do this? So I'm, I'm, I'm not one, I'm, I'm, I'm not happy, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm happy, but I'm not satisfied, I should say. But um, that does not at all temper my enthusiasm and my love for this community in the sense that we have some, some really high aspirational goals, and I think we'll get there. But we just got to keep fighting at it without getting so down on ourselves. And I'm, I'm amazed sometimes. I'm like, my God, do you realize what we have here? Um, we just have to build on it. So we will look to you all to keep the ball moving forward. Thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you all for coming out. We appreciate it. Um, and also a big thank you to United Way of Northern New Jersey for graciously hosting us this evening. This has been um, our fifth In Your Neighborhood Community Forum here in Montclair, talking about community engagement. This will be posted online on our uh, website, njtvonline.org. Thank you all so much for coming. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.